welcome. It's lovely to, to see all these faces again. And um, there's always that magic feeling when you suddenly appear. So welcome. And we're, we're up to week eight now. And I think people have received the program that's coming up as well, which goes into October. And it looks really interesting. Everyone is different. You never know quite what to expect. So we've got Debbie this morning, which is really great because she's had so much experience, a very kind in Samata. Uh, she tells me she's been practicing 39 years, so she was very wow. young when she started. <laughs> and uh, she's in Manchester and has um, been very involved with the Manchester Centre. She knew Lance very well and attended lots of his groups. Um, she's done a lot for Samata, chair of the management group at least once and other things I, 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 I know about. And um, I set up her own class in North Manchester there. So uh, very special, so glad. And I know that Debbie spent this year in Thailand. I'd heard about it, but I've never heard the, the detail. And I'm really interested and looking forward to, to hearing about it uh, with lots of visuals as well. So great stuff. So over to Debbie for you to just take okay. it from here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So you can hear me all right. Fine. Okay. Yes. So <laughs> talking about my experience of living in a temple in Thailand for a year. Um, way back in 1990, I was invited uh, by Ajahn Sanon Katapunyo uh, of the Wat Sangatan to stay at uh, his temple which was in Thailand, and he was the abbot there. And I met him at a dana at a Thai restaurant in Manchester, where he and the other Sangha members had been invited to, to receive food. Uh, mm -hmm. He'd come to visit the temple, uh, the one in, in Birmingham, which still exists today, and also to visit other uh, Thai communities. I'd never met him before. And by that time, I'd been practicing Samantha for, for about nine years. And so I took an open ticket, uh, not knowing how long I was going to be out there for, but I was ready for an adventure and um, just to explore a new country and get to know the people and the customs and also how Buddhism really worked, worked in, in that country, as well as, you know, traveling as a normal, ordinary tourist as well. And Ajahn Sanong also asked if I would teach English, which, which I was happy to do to him uh, and anyone else who wanted to learn. So a little bit about Ajahn Sanong. Um, he was born in 1944 and ordained as a monk at the age of 20. And in 1974, he was granted an old abandoned temple in the Nantaburi province near Bangkok. Uh, and that had a large sacred Buddha uh, a Buddhist statue. And this grew into a large, thriving temple. It had, it had a large, very large area of land as well. And also many other branches developed throughout Thailand and some in Europe, and as I said, um, Birmingham. And he just taught throughout his life. And he, I did learn that he actually passed away in about 2015. So I'm going to show you lots of photos of, of about the trip, <laughs> I've selected, carefully selected a few. And I hope to give you a flavor of how, how it felt to live in, in that Buddhist religious environment. I'm sure some of you have already done that anyway. Um, and to follow the eight precepts for a longer period of time and just take that one meal a day, um, attend festivals and meditate, meditate according to their system, which is not too dissimilar to what we would, we would we do. And in many ways, it was really fascinating. And uh, there was such a vibrancy uh, in the atmosphere. It felt in temple very, very alive and very wholesome. So it was actually easy to meditate. It just, it just flowed. And yet in other ways, there were difficulties, you know, such as coping with the heat and humidity, as I'm sure you'll know. And there was a lot of mosquitoes there as well at the time because there was a large pond and it was absolutely bitten alive <laughs> with infections all over, over my legs, um, which had to be treated. And there, and there was also very, very uh, spicy food, which you know about. And for a time, I was the only white person 
in, in, in the whole place. So that was a little bit uh, daunting. However, I felt very uh, welcomed and the people were very, very warm and treated me like family. And um, when I show you the pictures, you'll, you'll see the warmth is just, just coming through the, the photos. And you can see that the people come to the temple and they're, they're very devotional, the ones who do go to the temple. And that seems to bring a lot of joy. Uh, the atmosphere, as I said, is, is just electric, especially when there's festivals and many people came. And it was a world away, of course, from the world I knew, England. And also being able to see the amazing Buddhist architecture, the buildings, you know, see it firsthand, the, stu the statues, the stupas, the artwork. And, and this was also <laughs> just very uplifting. Um, seeing that the religion was, was very alive, the culture. Mm -hmm. And it was only on, on returning home after that year that you can reflect on the different chatting. You can hear me, yeah? Yes. Okay, so one of the things I missed, obviously besides the people, uh, was not seeing reminders of Buddhism and meditation everywhere. You know, the, the only image I might see would be either in a museum uh, in Britain or if, if you went to Manchester Centre or, or Wales and so all those reminders had gone um, and the sheer scale of them just just actually took your breath away just just blew you away sometimes um, today you know there are images and the statues of Buddhists it's easy to see them it's easy to see them online and, and, and enlarged but I personally only saw an image of a Buddha when I was 20 um, so just want to emphasize that you really get a sense there of the people's faith and that faith um, it, they go to the temple because it, it gives them a refuge and gives them comfort and merit making is seen as particularly important and while the lay people don't necessarily meditate um, you know that alone can <laughs> really catapult them <laughs> and, and give them a lot of happiness. Uh, and that sense of serving, that sense of, of giving and helping the, the Thai community. So I'm gonna now show you my, my slideshow and share the screen because I'm not good about talking. And show you some of the pictures, try and show you things that you, you know, unusual that you may not, you may not normally come across. So here, this is um, the room where people would come to visit uh, Ajahn and, and show their respects. And this is Ajahn Sunan on the left. <clears throat> I'm in the middle. And this is Joy. And Joy um, was um, helping and assisting as well as lots of other people. And in a more sort of organizational capacity. Not, not, in a, not personal, of course, she had male monks um, assisting, but um, she was a joy, she was called Joy, and she was a joy. And I really like the way you can see her, um, her image uh, reflected. You can see her image there, which is very sweet. And you might notice this uh, in the background, the skeleton, <clears throat> which was quite normal at that time to have in the temple, um, as Buddhists we know. Uh, that's one of the reflections <laughs> that, that can be done. We don't necessarily do it. Um, so you can see it's very nice. It's a comfortable, comfortable room where people would come to visit. And this is the house where I stayed, which is lovely. Um, I had a room in this house. There were other people coming and going as well. And we did have a, I wouldn't say we had a shower room, but we had had um, a, a bucket with a cup, a container, and then you would douse yourself. And you'd probably take at least three showers a day uh, to, to cool off a little bit. There's another view of the house with some gardens. And this is the room where some of the girls came to visit. Always smiling. And this is one of the kutis where the ladies, one of the ladies would stay. 
and there's a row of cuties. And there was lots of water running through as well, which I'll get to a little bit in a, in a moment about that. There's always water the canal. And <clears throat> I did see a few people, a few of the girls, ladies, shall I say, nuns, taking a silent retreat. So they would only stay in a kuti for, well, months on end. And um, they would receive food, and not speak to anybody. So there's no talking. And also slow walking. So sometimes I'd look and I'd see them walking incredibly slowly down the steps to get their food. And I did visit one actually, and we did have a, had a nice conversation. She, she was European. So there's little walkways. And this is, oh, again, the ladies area, little planks to walk across the water. So this is a kind of kitchen, so to speak, and the lady is uh, preparing some, some uh, chilies and lemongrass and they would sit on the wooden benches and um, chop up the food. And they didn't just have to wear white, they could, you could also wear brown, which was more practical if you were taking the eight precepts. And this is uh, of one of the ponds, large lake, which would be filled with fish because that was seen as a merit-making activity to uh, release uh, wildlife and to release creatures, sea creatures. <laughs> and several times it was, it was so hot, I was very tempted to swim there. And I was wondering, why, why is nobody else swimming in there? <laughs> so I went in one day with, with Joy waiting for me on, on the bank. And... Um, on the side there, I saw this enormous snake covered and mottled, um, gigantic snake. And yeah, that was pretty frightening. Got out as quickly as I could. <laughs> and this is a typical uh, sala, uh, one of the festivals. And they, the ladies here would be waiting to show respect to the Ajahn. And there was a huge outdoor area, you can see, where people would just come from the local areas to offer food and show respect. And in the background, you can see the, the parasols where people would sleep outdoors, actually, and, ha and they would put their mosquito nets over those. Some of the monks going on the arms round, where I am, observing. And they had a lot of people to feed back at the temple. There was lots of lay people as well. So this is a truck. Uh, and so they would receive the food. It was always so abundant offerings, which then would be emptied into the truck to send people, uh, serve people back home. And this is one of the tables. So there'd be several tables filled with all varieties of food and people, once it's been offered, then they will take their morning meal. And some young boys there attending just for sort of the weekend or school holiday. Taking their food. So this was the um, main uh, shrine hall temple area with this um, sacred uh, Buddha in it, Buddha. You can see that there's very little uh, gold leaf on, on the Buddha and the, the, the building itself is quite simple. <clears throat> and I remembered uh, years later they were collecting gold, uh, asking for an amnesty if you like, to melt it down and to uh, regild the Rupa. And I did look at the website, and this is how it looks now. <laughs> it's completely transformed, like 30 years later, or how, how many years it took, beautifully gilded inside a fantastic building. How it's transformed. And this is the outside of the building, which is very different. So going back to 1990, 
again, uh, I don't think they were in the, the new, the new uh, sala, but here um, you have the objects again for reflection, the impermanence, <laughs> the skeletons, which, you know, was normal. The, the people there would see that as normal thing to see, the Thai people. reclining one. And at the festival, you can see there, again, lots of um, merit making, giving, money trays, people giving gifts, or requisites, shall we say, requisites. So this would have been one of the full moon days, and um, those taking eight precepts who were visiting, gathering up the, the offerings, the incense and the, the flowers to uh, chant around the um, Rupa in the evening. So that would have been the evening chanting and going walking around the stupa, or sorry, the Rupa. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> There would be morning and evening chanting that would be part of the everyday life of, in the temple anyway. And here is the, uh, the, the life inside these buckets, all the sea creatures, that would be ready to be um, offered and released. Again, a merit-making activity. And this is a, the Songkran festival, which marks the start of the Thai New Year where people pour perfumed water into the hands of the elderly and monks as an act of humility and respect. And water is also a symbol to cleanse a person from all the past year's misfortune. And you can see from the picture, they're, they're really enjoying it. Um, it seems to be uh, transformational. And uh, it goes one step further, doesn't it? They end up being doused uh, from the head <laughs> with the water. You can see the interaction of the people, very close interaction. A young boy with flowered petals. This is Ajahn, <laughs> he's completely wet, soaked. And this, uh, that's me, Dao Singh. Uh, this is Ajahn Boon Song, who, who I went with him and some of the Sai members up to the north, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. So here I am teaching some English, finally. <laughs> the few, few men, uh, there were some ladies who did attend. And um, as regards teaching the abbot, uh, I would get to his room maybe about six in the morning. There'd be maybe about half an hour in which to teach English before uh, people started to arrive. And as I was taking eight precepts at the time, so having only one meal a day, by the morning coming, the morning came, I was absolutely really quite hungry. And we'd get a real treat of like this very sweet condensed milk coffee. <laughs> it was incredibly sweet. But it was, um, yeah, it was, it was delicious. And if any of you have taken eight precepts for an extended period, for some reason having that main meal uh, before noon, it does tend to evoke a very strange, uh, beautiful feeling after eating. Um, you know, the meditation just sort of happens, I suppose. Uh, but it was, you know, on the other hand, it was a struggle not to eat too much. And as time went on, um, I did tend to have breakfast early as well as um, the main meal before, before noon. And uh, there's people listening to a sermon or receive or giving, um, giving offerings. So as, um, there was the opportunity to travel with Ajahn and the Sangha and other monks as they were often invited to officiate at various ceremonies and they would receive dana there. And the ceremonies usually you know, were funerals, that's what's what they do, <laughs> and other Buddhist festivals. 
and on on the way on these travels you could also visit we'd stop off at different special sites of interest and you can see here also a sense of devotion that people this rupa is just covered in gold leaf and it's flapping around um, again it's a merit making activity and you visited um this is a seated buddha at wat pa lale warihan in supamburi enormous seated buddha so i don't know if any of you recognize this monk but i remember being told that we were going to see a very important um monk i didn't know who it was and it was only looking back at my pictures, this is, this is actually the 19th Supreme Patriarch. And um, we had an audience with him, and I'm taking this picture. And he passed away in uh, 2013. Another place to visit, which you may have visited, uh, at a Pitsanalok, and this is quite a famous uh, temple. This Buddha is beautiful. It's the Pra Buddha Chinarat at Wat Pra Si Ratana Mahatat. And my pictures are a little bit old and fuzzy, but um, this would would be how we would always pose for a photo, <laughs> always uh, seated in front of the, the Rupa. You get a, a better view. Uh, really beautiful. And Again, reminders, here's some more reminders of everywhere, the Buddhist culture, beautiful stupa. This is Wat Po, the temple complex in Bangkok. A very impressive series of buildings. There's the, the guardians in the background there. And a group of us come to have a tour. I'd like that guardian to guard my, my, my house <laughs> or my mind. <laughs> and uh, so this is the reclining Buddha and uh, you recognize the, the feet behind me, which has 108 arranged panels showing all the auspicious symbols, yeah, including the wheels on the soles of the feet. And here's Ajahn uh, releasing some birds to set them free. Again, another ritual. And there's some guardians there in the background. So this is um, <clears throat> my brother, Andrew, who came to, to visit. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he wasn't a Buddhist, he'd never done uh, anything to do with meditation, but um, he was really welcomed at the temple and Ajahn took us around visiting places. Uh, he was about 24 there and um, sadly he passed away when he was 34. But nice that he visited. And I had a few other visitors. Uh, this is Diana who came to visit as well and her travels and actually also Francis's parents uh, came <laughs> they were very excited to see an authentic uh, Buddhist environment and uh, I made them a very nice sweet cup of tea which they thoroughly enjoyed now I'm not entirely sure where this is um, maybe one of you can tell me after it's quite beautiful the way it's silhouetted in, in the, uh, as the dusk approaches. Somewhere in Bangkok, near Bangkok. And uh, the famous um, uh, what, which one is this? Hmm. One second. Let's 
Yes, I think uh, this is Doisa Tep. So I'm traveling up there with um, Ajahn uh, Bunsong here and uh, some other monks and nuns. And uh, this is, yes, this is uh, Chiang Mai up north, the Wat Prai Thai Doisa Tep, which is considered a very sacred site by many because it guards a holy relic. And you have these very imposing Naga steps. <laughs> And at the top, you see the beautiful stupa. I think this is another place. I don't think that's Doi Sutap. It's gilding, isn't it? It's good. And um, we visited another temple. Can't remember what, what it was na named, but... Um, Again, you have the Buddha sitting on a coiled serpent and the, the Naga heads, which look really quite terrifying. <laughs> you wouldn't want to mess with uh, them. And in the gardens, you have beautiful uh, little cherubs, statues dancing in pond. And this was in Chiang Mai, dressing up, having a bit of fun. National dress. And reminded us of artwork, as I say. Some of this was all being just created. As you can see, all new artwork all the time being made. Yes, we visited the countryside and um, that was one of the caves where there would have been retreats happening inside the cave, actually. So this is um, the Ajahn's teacher's temple and he is seated there under this white parasol. And at that time he was in his 80s. His name was Ajahn Sangwan Kemiko. And this temple is in Supanburi, north of Bangkok. And it's also the Songkran Festival, I believe, where they are showing their, paying their respects. And it's this ominous uh, temple, beautiful temple in the background. And as you can see, this, this monk is, is videoing the event and they were always videoing, they were always taking photos. They certainly were not camera shy. <laughs> you know, it was promotional, of course. Um, I think they had their own um, TV channel or radio channel. And here is Ajahn Chemico with uh, Ajahn Sanong. Oh, and me. <laughs> and a uh, beautiful ceremony, and I'm pouring water over Ajahn Chemico's feet. He really did have quite a, um, a presence. There was really something quite uh, magical about him. And the monks showing respect. Okay, so this um, This is one of the things that the uh, monastic community would have been asked to do, and that is to carry out a, a, a cremation And uh, at that time. And so we, we were at a village somewhere, and spontaneously um, there, there was creation. cremation that just sort of happened, or maybe it was planned right in front of your eyes. Going back to the, uh, <clears throat> the temple in Antiburi, one of the festivals, there would have been uh, donating blood as well. <laughs> Donation. This is one of the European uh, visitors. She stayed in the house too, which is really nice company. And some young, Young boys posing, sitting 
very kindly letting me take their photos. This would have been the, um, the male area, which was again, very spread out. And you get a feel now that this is very quiet. You know, it's the opposite to the ceremonies. There's not many people. It's a very tranquil environment. There was many, many crickets as well, which, which would make a deafening sound. But somehow it was a beautiful sound, very strange. And here it is, very quiet, very tranquil, quiet days. <laughs> so this is me leaving after one year um, they came to say goodbye and brought, brought me to the airport, which was very kind, very kind of them. It was a bittersweet moment to, to say goodbye. And, um, and then, finally, before I end the slideshow anyway, <laughs> this was about uh, seven years later when Najan uh, Sanon came to Birmingham and uh, went to visit him with my, my second child, Nicola. <laughs> it's very nice to see him again. So, I'd like to talk a little bit just about, um, I'm gonna exit that, stop the share. <laughs> Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the types of meditation, what, what was done, which is mostly quite familiar to, to yourselves. Um, where am I today? One of the main teachings, um, well, most of the sermons were delivered in Thai, <laughs> and I got to hear a lot of the same words, you know. So you'd hear Buddha a lot, Buddha, 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 Jiao. Um, but one of the main actually for meditation would have been using the word Buddha and um, reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And it, which is easy because it just comes alive when, when you're in the temple, provided you are, allow yourself to be uh, open to that. And there was also a lot of walking mindfulness you know, simple tasks, cleaning your kuti, cleaning your hut. Um, and even in 1990, they actually produced this chanting book, um, which is in English, translated into English. So there's morning and evening chanting. Uh, there is the five subjects of frequent recollection, including, um, you know, your heir to your karma, and there was reflections on universal well-being, the four Brahma Viharas, uh, and even the formless absorptions that is mentioned in teachings. And also particularly to reflect on, um, recollect the 32 parts of the body, actually, which starts with the hair on the head. Kesa, Loma, Naka, Tanta, Tacho, hair on the head, hair on the body, nails, teeth, skin, which is a practice that I don't particularly, I don't do, to be honest, but um, that's what was taught. Um, and there's some other books also, even translated to the English, even in 1990, and you can find these teachings online, actually. Uh, this is Ajahn Samuel Kemiko, even some of his, his talks is translated into English. And I would say that both Samatha and Vipassana was taught, um, uh, particularly, as I say, the Buddha. So breathing in, wood, breathing out, to, knowing the rising and the falling of the abdomen, or the in and out breath at the nostrils, and being mindful to know every breath, and keep bringing your mind back to the breath. The mind will calm down and becomes more concentrated. 
And he also talks about developing patience and endurance to know if you feel happy or you feel sad, light or heavy. Um, and somewhere he writes, if you reach a deep level of Samatha, then the teacher will suggest you develop insight and meditation where you have to come back to your body and mind and you should contemplate the body, see it as four elements, see its impermanence, unsatisfactory and not self. By doing so, you may leave behind the pictures of concentration meditation, i.e. the limiter, leave that behind and insight might arise. Um, <clears throat> so summing up the talk, I would say it was a very rich experience, especially looking back at the photos. <laughs> it, brought, it brought back many emotions and memories and, and, and even dreams sometimes. Um, and there was never a feeling of awe or like um, superiority, although there is a, um, a level of seniority. Um, it was just a feeling that uh, you were just like with your extended family and like you were just with uh, some very good friends. Uh, so that is the end of the talk. <laughs> um, I would like to maybe do a little bit on um, uh, afterwards on meditation and, and reflection on universal well-being. But if you have any any observations or is there anything to comment on, I'm very happy to to hear it. I don't know. May I? Yeah. Do I need to? I can hear. I can hear. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, De Debbie. It was fascinating, and the images, you know, very evocative. Especially your presence there. It's quite <laughs> unique, that actually. And I suppose, um, in a way, we practice, don't we? You know, in Manchester and Green Street, but um, remembering where it comes from, actually, and all the variety of practice and way of life that goes with it just just wonderful and fascinating uh, really um, I've got a number of sort of thoughts in my head and questions I suppose that other people might have as well I suppose um, because we're of a different culture did that ever seem to get in the way you seem to just merge into it so no, well it was a bit of both was there um, yes yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think because I knew I was there temporarily, I, I, could, I could embrace it. But there was a point where I'd said to myself, what, what am I doing in this godforsaken place? Yeah, because, you know, the heat was, was unbearable, the foods, as I've already said. Mm -hmm. But um, on the other hand, um, I wanted to embrace that experience, and they were very, very warm. Um, I, I suppose I could have stayed longer. But... <laughs> Yes, it was in many in many respects. It was quite alien. It was alien. <laughs> but then being part of it, wonderful! What an amazing experience. You know, you don't know how far it goes deep into yourself, really. Um, the, yeah, the med the meditational aspects. Um, just you just allow yourself to go with it, and it just happens. It, it as I said in the talk, it's it's actually very very easy. And they feel a, a sense of protection. I think that's one of the things you really get from it. And uh, uh, is this fake? Is this real? But you, you do feel protected and there's a lot of respect. Even when you go out and about, say you're out and about in the street, there is a sense of you being protected if you're wearing the white robes. Mm -hmm. You're protected by that. Um, Maybe that's what it's for. So it'd be lovely to hear anybody else like to offer their responses, questions. I know a few people like Miranda and Ian and Rosie and there's others probably and um, where is she? Marjorie, we've all been through some of these experiences in Thailand, haven't we? So um, let's open up to other people. Just just indicate if you'd like to say anything or yeah. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> well, I haven't ever spent a year in a temple, but no. uh, a monastery. I have been 
to visit and um, on numerous occasions. And I think I absolutely agree with what you say, Debbie. It's as if once you're there, you are completely protected. Um, even the getting there, I've always found um, a, a sense of being protected, that there's going to be nothing untoward happening to me. But the other thing that you said, and I absolutely agree with this as well, it's as though mindfulness just comes on you and, um, and practice is very simple to do. Uh, and it's an, a most amazing feeling, um, something that once you've um, experienced it, um, uh, you would like to experience it over and over again. And it is something to do with the, I think, with the warmth of people and, and the mindfulness that they're, that exists in, in a monastery like that. I'm yeah. just wondering though, Debbie, have you ever felt like going back for another period of time now that you're older or would it be too um, hard for you? Yeah, it would probably, probably be a little less tolerant. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I have, I have. I would like to visit. But there's, there are temples in, in, near to me. There's actually one up the road, which I go sometimes. <laughs> but it's not Wat Sangatan, it's... Uh, predominantly the Pasana, but the thing is it's mostly Thai people. So again, you still feel um, slightly out of it because it's really the Thai, for the, it's to serve the Thai community. So I would say I feel most comfortable with Santa. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I certainly do. And, and the weird and wacky things that we do, <laughs> which, which is wonderful, the way we can explore um, different things and also I think um, that particular temple it was a holy place you know as, as, I've, as I've heard said that um, Green Street is a holy place and we, we should embrace that that mm. when you've been doing practice for a very long time um, it just kind of morphs into that you can't help it you know I never set, set, out, set off to be a Buddhist but um, Hey ho! It's 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 grabbed me, and um, we're acknowledging that these are holy places, like Green Street and the Temple. You feel blessed in a way. You feel blessed, especially when you know you go through troubles, you go through difficulties, because we, you know we do, and I do frequently, and uh, where you, everything's gone and you've lost everything, or you feel, you know, those negative feelings come back and. Uh, you have to kind of key, key into it again because that's that's maybe your karma that is my karma and uh, you know, one has to accept that <laughs> so we're in, in other words we're in it for the long haul yeah we're in it for the long haul however long it takes however long it takes whether i don't know does it matter mm. and that and i think we need, really need to embrace that feeling of why not? Why not say it's a holy place? Temple is supposed to be a religious place and mystical, even mystical. Magical things can happen and do. After all, practice, practice is magical. Mm -hmm. Special sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're trying to get back to Green Street, aren't we? <laughs> We missed it. it. Seems like ages. Yeah, yeah. And all, and also this aspect of them trying to um, get this stupor going. Um, some may not think it's necessary, but I, I understand why they want to do it. Mm. Yeah, very much so. It's all a good intention to create something very magnificent, and and it's natural to temple. Even the temple in Kersley, you know, they have tons of statues. Kersley, which is five minutes drive from me. Um, I was there recently and they've got even more statues of coming in and they've got a, a stoop, but they have got a stoop outside um, that, that has been made, a smallish one, but it's still very nice. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you like to do a little bit of practice? Well, yeah. Does anyone, I'm just checking anyone else wanting to contribute or ask or before we, we move to that. Uh, Leslie, Leslie Ann. I was in Thailand in February this year for the whole month, and I, it was my 
first visit uh, to Thailand, I found, as you say, it was quite magical. And I, <clears throat> I made a point of going to some of the temples or going to lots of, as many as I could. And I found that how humbling it was for me. Um, and, and, and I just felt, as you say, you feel so peaceful. There's, there's no, there's no, um, you don't feel agitated at all, not agitated, but there's a very calming effect I found in, in, in Thailand. And I loved it. I absolutely um, wish I could have embellished it more. Or, or, I found that uh, where we went, various places, um, we traveled up and down the country, that uh, not a lot of English was spoken. So I found it a little difficult to try and communicate or ask questions. Um, people that could help me, that could say, well, yes, you need to go to here or this week and take you to that place. So I had to basically find, well, I was with another person, but find them myself. But it was, it was delightful, and I'm very, very glad I've had that experience in life to be able to do this, and hopefully sometime I might be able to return. It was lovely. 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 We should all go to Green Tree <laughs> when we can. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> or, you know, it's about bringing it into the environment we're in. I have to say, I have missed, um, I have missed going to Green Street um, because being closed, I just find it, again, for me, Green Street is just one of the places I, yeah. is my closest and I just, I love going there because it just makes me feel so good. Yeah, and, and of course it isn't the place necessarily. It's no, the, it's not. It's, it's the, the people that make it. It's the whole thing. <laughs> There's a song about that. People. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's all the people, isn't it? And and the history of the place and the vibration. I don't say I like say the vibration. What's left behind? What's there? Um, yeah. Miranda, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just thought um, <clears throat> it might be interesting for uh, women in the summer to particularly to know that. Well, I, I had the experience of going to um, a women's temple <coughs> in the south of Thailand, not far from the Malaysian border. And I had heard about this place from a Thai woman that I found myself sitting next to on the plane coming back from Thailand after spending um, several weeks uh, with um, Ajahn Sudhira uh, in Isan <coughs> at his temple. And she told me about this uh, women's temple where the women were actually fully ordained, but they'd had to be ordained by Sri Lankan monk. And, and they were not uh, legal, but they were fully ordained. So I went down there, I spent a week there, it is all, but I'd already been in Thailand for some weeks. Um, and it was just very interesting. It was quite different. It was quite a small compound. Um, the abbot, uh, she was a woman, and her sister was also um, a nun there, and they were wearing brown robes. Um, what was interesting was that it was a very um, socially aware group of women. It wasn't big. <coughs> um, and one nun had her old mother there that she was looking after, a very old mother. Um, a younger one, who very much befriended me, was, had her daughter, young daughter, living there. <coughs> Excuse me. Who was going to school and coming back. Um, and so there was that kind of thing going on. I suppose that does... Yes, it, it, it happened happen. at that temple as well. There was... Yeah, um, yeah I suppose that does happen. In, there was a large lay community. And there was... Um, I didn't see the monk's side, but there was nuns there. And um, with with elderly parents, mm. with children yeah. who who would be living there. Actually. Yes, living there. I did. I also met. Um, I did meet Ajahn Sutton's father, <clears throat> who was very old at that time. Mm. He was staying. He was living there, and so was his brother. Right. Both monks. Yeah. But there's also a large lay community because they help, and they fix the buses to take them off to where they need to go, <laughs> and mm. all the other practical issues. Yeah. Practical things. 
Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, they probably, they don't, I don't know about now, but they didn't, they didn't, they wouldn't have had the health service in Britain. No. Uh, that's the other thing. So they rely very much on people to help, mm. especially as they get older. Do they have care homes? And if they have yeah. care homes. Mm. <clears throat> well, this place, although it was so-called illegal, um, was very well, um, you know, it, it was, they were very respected. They went on arms around the women, just like the monks. Yeah. And they were very well um, supported. It was an interesting experience. Different, felt different. Isn't it Ajahn Brahm who, who is prepared to uh, um, ordain, ordain women? And it's as a, yes, no, he has done, hasn't he? And he's been uh, criticised for that. But I believe there's getting more and more support for uh, ordaining women in Thailand amongst the Thai mm. people. I mean, I didn't have a problem with this uh, so-called um, pecking order. You know, where the, it, it's um, very much in that Thai community that you respect your elders and you, you always are below them, but you know, you're not you're showing respect and awe to, to the Buddha and what that, that person represents. So it's fine. It wasn't an issue. And it's good for humility, as someone else was saying. Yeah. Humble yourself. So would you like to do <coughs> a little bit of practice? Of course. Of course, De Debbie. Are you happy to lead that practice for us? Uh, yes, because I just wanted to do it something a little bit different based on what I was talking about the Buddha. Um, because, you know, we're, we're very used to doing the stages of the breathing. But I thought we could use the mantra of the Buddha. And then at some point, the mantra of the Dhammo. Dhammo and then at some point, the mantra of the Sangha. So, say five minutes of each. And then after that, I will um, do the reflection on sharing blessings as, as per the translation in, in this chanting book. So sit comfortably. And don't control your breath, but just breathe in wood and breathe out dough. Bring your attention to the syllables, but an and do out. It doesn't matter if you your breath is shallow or deep or you feel a little bit anxious, <laughs> nervous. And now move to the mantra, Dhammo, breathe in Dham, breathe out Mo. Try to hold your attention to the mantra, Dhammo. And now move to the mantra Sankam. Breathe in Sang 
without go. Feel the connection with the others on here and a connection with your other friendly meditators, teachers. Now I'm going to read to you um, the reflection on sharing blessings. And so you just absorb it. By the blessings that have arisen from my practice, may my venerable preceptors and teachers who have helped me, mother, father, and relatives, king and queen, worldly powers, virtuous human beings, the supreme beings, demons and high gods, the guardian deities of the world, <coughs> celestial beings, the lord of death, people, friendly, indifferent and hostile, May all beings be well. May the skillful deeds done by me bring you threefold bliss. May this quickly bring you to the deathless. By this act of goodness and through the act of sharing, may I likewise attain the cutting off of craving and clinging Whatever thoughts I have, until I attain liberation, may they quickly perish. Wherever I am born, may there, may there be an upright mind, mindfulness and wisdom, austerity and vigor. 
May harmful influences not weaken my efforts. The Buddha is the unexcelled protector. The Dhamma is the supreme protection. Peerless is the silent Buddha. The Sangha is my tr true refuge. By the power of these supreme ones, may I rise above all ignorance. So I'll just chant a blessing, unless someone else would like to chant a blessing. <laughs> Anybody else would? We're still deep in, deep, deep in meditation. <laughs> Deborah, yeah, Deborah, chant the blessing. Okay. Um, so if you have a chanting book, I think it's on page 31. Bhava to Sapa Nanga Langra, can to Sapa Devata, Sapa Bodha Nubawena, Sada Soti, Bawan to Te. Bawa to Sapa Manga Langra, can to Sapa Devata, Sapa Dhamma Nuba Vena, Sada Soti, Bawan to Te, Bawa to Sapa Manga Langra, can to Sapa Devata, Sapa Sankhanu. Bawena sada suti bawan tu te sadu 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 thank you wonderful <laughs> so thank you very much for joining me and uh, I hope you enjoyed it <laughs> as much as as much as I enjoyed um, preparing it. And um, yeah, I was very nervous about being because it's so personal. <laughs> it's very very personal. Um, but I hope you get uh, a feeling of how how it really was and how much I truly miss it. Mm. Thank you, Debbie. Thank, Thank you, lovely. lovely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. 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 Thank you, Debbie. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you lots, Debbie. Well Thank done. You. Well done. <laughs> <laughs>